Our next speaker is um, Ram Subramanian. There we go. So who's going to talk to us about liver failure, the view of Mars from Earth. So we're continuing the theme of cleverly named talks. Um, so Ram's going to discuss the use of Mars as adjunctive therapy as it relates to liver failure and how we manage those patients in the ICU. Well, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, can you hear me in the back? We're good. Um, I want to thank the organizers for inviting me today. So we're talking about um, there's something called MARS. So just to decode the title a bit more, MARS is an acronym for an extracorporeal liver support system that we are currently using at Emory. So the topic is actually going to deal with our current understanding and advancements in the use of extracorporeal liver support in the treatment of uh, liver failure. So just as disclosures, I, I am a consultant for a couple of companies that are involved in uh, extracorporeal liver assist devices. So I'll start with a case, and this is a case from, the, uh, from one of our ICUs approximately two years ago. It's a 40-year-old lady with uh, no significant past medical history. She showed up in an outside emergency room with a two-day history of worsening uh, jaundice and fatigue. Here initial labs, she's got an INR of two and a half, she's got a transaminitis, uh, she's got a very elevated bilirubin of 20. And then she starts developing worsening encephalopathy. And then when that happens, she gets transferred to our ICU for further management. The concern based on the initial coagulopathy and the encephalopathy is that she's developing the initial signs of acute liver failure. And then we work her up. We have a detailed serum workup and a history workup. And there is some um, data that comes about that she actually has been taking a fair amount of Tylenol mixed in with Advil for some chronic back pain for the past few days and in more than recommended amounts. And so she's given a presumptive diagnosis of drug-induced uh, acute liver failure. And then the dreaded complication or the concern uh, that we all uh, in these patients that we're concerned about is she starts developing worsening confusion, worsening encephalopathy, and she requires intubation for, uh, for worsening, for every protection for worsening encephalopathy. Things get worse. Her INR now goes from two and a half to 10 and eventually unmeasurable. And this is happening in the face of a decreasing transaminitis. So she's actually losing liver to even necrose, and the INR is, is off the charts. And then the, one of the last uh, sort of complications that you see in these patients, she starts developing severe hypoglycemia, which is one of the last things to go, and she starts requiring a D10 drip to maintain a viable serum glucose. So we're thinking about treatment options, and one option is liver transplantation. But unfortunately, there are some psychosocial concerns. We're unable to find family at this stage, uh, so we cannot um, immediately consider her for emergent uh, liver transplantation. And so, in order to buy some time and also to potentially reverse this physiology, we uh, start MARS therapy. And we'll, we'll talk more about what this device, uh, that acronym stands for. And the remarkable thing about this case is we maintained her for four days, 96 hours, in a state of pretty much anapatic uh, function. She has no um, intrinsic liver function but we keep her on this device and maintain stable organ system function, including neurologic function, cardiopulmonary function, um, and maintain a coagulopathy state that is acceptable. And then luckily for her, we're able to figure out her psychosocial status and approve for liver transplant. And she undergoes successful transplantation uh, using Mars as a bridge. Um, and uh, she did very well. Uh, intraoperatively, postoperatively. I actually saw in clinic three weeks ago, and she's doing great. As you can imagine, the explant that came out of uh, the, from the surgery showed massive hepatic necrosis. It was hard to even find a functional hepatocyte on that, on that slide. Um, so I think this, in my mind, is a truly remarkable case of sustaining somebody for a prolonged period of time with no liver function. And we've done a few of these cases now. Um, I can imagine about two other cases that we've um, done in the recent past. So with that case as a background, let me define the outline for the rest of the talk. We'll review the rationale for the need for liver 
support? Why do we need extracorporeal liver support in this day and age? We'll briefly touch on the two forms of liver failure, how we classify liver failure, because I think it'll be important to revisit that as we define the role of these extracorporeal liver devices in, in liver failure. Um, we'll talk about this MARS system um, that, uh, that you saw in the title, and then a few thoughts about future applications. Where is this field headed um, based on the current uh, evidence? So let's talk about rationale. Why do we need a liver support system? So this is data from the federal database, the UNOS database uh, that tracks transplants, and this is in 2014. So the number of people awaiting transplants, or the recipients, or the potential recipients of 120,000. When you look at the number of donors in the registry, it is uh, tremendously lower than the number of recipients. It's almost tenfold lower. It's about 12,000 or 13,000. So because of this enormous discrepancy between the potential recipients and the potential donors, you have a lot of folks dying on the wait list. And it's estimated it's about 20 wait list recipients per day are dying on the wait list because of lack of organs. And this is for all organs. And if you were to extrapolate this data to liver failure patients, you can anticipate that this mortality rate is even higher in these patients since they're sicker as they await liver transplantation. So there's a problem. So because of this tremendous discrepancy between organ supply and demand, I think we have to th actively think about strategies that either A, facilitate hepatic recovery. So if you create a window of opportunity for that the dysfunctional liver to regenerate, because the liver is one, has one of the unique properties of regenerating, and give enough time for the patient's liver to recover, you can prevent further liver damage and, and facilitate hepatic recovery so they won't need a liver transplant. Or number two, you stabilize liver function, for example, in a cirrhotic who is decompensated to a degree where you can stabilize that hepatic function and bridge them successfully to liver transplantation. So I think as we think about these two strategies in particular, I think this is where there may be an emerging role for an extracorporeal liver support system. So let's talk about the two forms of liver failure. And I would, as we talk about this, um, I would think about how an extracorporeal liver support will fit into these two sp specific forms of liver failure. So the first form, we define it as acute liver failure. And this is strictly defined as acute hepatic dysfunction in the absence of chronic liver disease, i.e., young person, no past liver disease, comes in with a Tylenol overdose, like the case we saw. So that's acute hepatic failure. The thing to recognize in this form of liver failure is that if you can stabilize liver function, you can potentially give that liver a chance to recover uh, fully and, and, and then regain or reverse back to normal hepatic function following hepatic regeneration. The second form is what we commonly see in ICUs is the decompensated cirrhotic. So a classic example, hepatitis C cirrhotic comes in with a very seal blade. And we define that category of liver failure as acute on chronic liver failure. Um, and the important thing to take home from this is, especially as you think about an extracorporeal liver support system, that liver is not going to go back to baseline normal function. The fibrosis or the cirrhosis is set. And so when you think about stabilization or the role of extracorporeal liver support in this setting, it is, um, I think the role would be to stabilize that decompensate cirrhotic so that it can uh, stabilize them enough to take them to liver transplantation. So I just want to briefly share these terminologies with you as far as differentiating acute liver failure from acute, acute and chronic liver failure as you think about the application of liver assist devices. So what is our current thinking of the uh, mechanistic rationale for such a liver assist device? So here's a, a normal liver that then gets an insult. This could be an acute hepatic insult that we see in acute liver failure or a decompensated cirrhotic who then develops a variceal bleed, for example. So when you have uh, acute hepatic dysfunction, you can have the accumulation of toxins in the serum, which in part may be hepatic specific. And these toxins have two, uh, at least two effects. One is, I think all of you have seen this, is it can have downstream effects of creating or causing multi-organ system failure. And I think you've seen this in various flavors. 
severe hepatic encephalopathy from a CNS standpoint, from a cardiovascular standpoint, it can have a profound distributive shock. And then from a renal standpoint, it can have some unique derangements such as hepatorenal syndrome. So that is one problem as these toxins accumulate in the blood. The second thing we've come to realize more and more is that there is a negative feedback loop on the ability of the liver to regenerate. So these toxins can then go back into the hepatic circulation and impair hepatic regeneration. So there's a sort of a double whammy as these toxins accumulate. So if you were to come up with a system that can eliminate these toxins using an extracorporeal circuit, you can have the dual benefit of not only ameliorating or decreasing the multi-organ system failure complications, but also giving the intrinsic liver a chance to recover and gain sufficient function towards spontaneous recovery or a new stable state of cirrhosis. So I think this is where, again, a liver assist device may, be, may find its role or, or niche here. So just to summarize those slides, here as you start with liver failure, we have dif differentiated between ALF or acute liver failure versus ACLF or acute and chronic liver failure. When you superimpose an extracorporeal liver circuit, I think in the setting of ALF, you can think about the liver device being used as a bridge to intrinsic recovery. We've done that a few times. Or, as we saw in the case, when the damage is too far done, to use a bridge to liver transplantation. Conversely, when you um, compare that to ACLF, I think there, when you think about an extracorporeal liver circuit, I think here, because there's too much fibrosis already existing, I think this can be thought of as a bridge to temporary stabilization with an eventual hope towards liver transplantation. So when you, so let's just sort of switch gears and specifically talk about liver assist devices. So we currently divide liver assist devices into two categories. The first category is what we define as artificial liver support, i.e. there is no active hepatocytes in the extracorporeal circuit. An example of that is what we'll be talking about today, is the MARS system, and the MARS system stands for Molecular Adsorbent Recirculating System, and we'll talk about why that, why that has that term. The second, which we won't be talking about today, is falls under the category of a bioartificial liver device system. And, and, and the reason why it's called a bioartificial system is you actually have hepatocytes that are impregnated into a column that sits outside the liver, and the patient's blood is, or plasma is, flown, is passed through that. So just a brief word about how we're thinking about liver assist devices. One is artificial, and one is bioartificial. So let's get into the details of the MARS system. So this stands for, again, for Molecular Adsorbent Recirculating System. But before we get into that, let's briefly talk about albumin. So we think about albumin as a volume expander in critical care. But in the setting of liver dysfunction, and specifically in the setting of cirrhosis, there's ample data that albumin has multiple other properties. Um, and so, as is outlined here, it, it can act as a transporter and a scavenger for multiple molecules and proteins. Um, with regard to sort of binding ability, and I want to draw your attention to sort of the toxins that we'll, we'll elaborate more on, it has the property to bind to some of these toxins that can accumulate in hepatic dysfunction uh, and may have an important role in preventing the downstream negative effects that we spoke about. And then finally, there's data emerging that in addition to the quantitative defects that we see in liver dysfunction, so you know the cirrhotic who rolls in with an albumin of one and a half, now we've come to realize that in liver dysfunction or in chronic liver dysfunction, actually the albumin can also have qualitative defects. So some of these binding sites that are, that you and I work really well in, in, metab or in binding certain substances may be compromised in chronic liver dysfunction. So there's a qualitative dysfunction in addition to quantitative dysfunction. So that makes the role of a extracorporeal circuit with albumin very, very attractive as you can then correct some of these uh, problems that exist with the intrinsic albumin in liver dysfunction. So this is the MARS system. Um, the, um, sorry, how are we doing time, by the way? We are out. <laughs> All right, so let me just, can I summarize in two slides? Okay. 
So just to briefly go, so I, I think I'll just give you two more slides here. So um, this is the uh, dialysis membrane. And I, what I want to do is just in the next couple of slides, highlight the difference between this membrane and the CRT membrane. Um, that this membrane is such that in addition to the circular molecules that come across, which are the free, free low molecule weight um, substances such as potassium, BU, and creatinine, that normally come off with CRT, this system allows, because of the pore size, and the second issue is the dialysate is different. It's not a bicarbonate-based dialysate. It's actually an albumin-based dialysate. So in addition to water-soluble toxins, you also have the transfer of these triangular toxins that are specifically albumin-bound, such as bilirubin, free fatty acids, nitric oxide, interestingly, and also some endogenous benzodiazepines that can contribute to hepatic encephalopathy. So that is the essential, one of the, the main differences between, we look at the Mars circuit versus the CRT membrane or CRT circuit, is that because the differential pore size the differential, and the different dialysate, you suddenly create a diffusion gradient for molecules, that, additional molecules that can come off uh, apart from those that come off in CRT. And the last, uh, can, I give, can I do two more slides? Is that all right? Yeah. So, on the right side are the water-soluble toxins. So examples of this are BUN, creatinine. Here is a whole list of other molecules that are specifically albumin-bound that can now, can now come off in the Mars circuit. And examples of these are benzodiazepines, and I think that is why we're seeing a lot of efficacy in refractory hepatic encephalopathy. Um, bilirubin comes off excellently with the Mars circuit. CRT will not remove bilirubin. Um, and finally, nitric oxide can also efficiently come off of this. And that may be the reason why we are seeing some hemodynamic benefits from the Mars circuit. The last slide, this is CRT, single membrane. And you, I think you're all familiar with this. This is the Mars membrane that we have in, in function. So here is the Mars membrane with an albumin dialysate that extracts the patient's toxins. And just the important thing to note is this albumin dialysate has a combination not only of water-soluble toxins, but also those albumin-bound toxins that we spoke about. So you're increasing your clearance of toxins that specifically accumulate in hepatic failure. And then these toxins get sequentially cleansed by a CRT machine first that gets rid of the water-soluble toxins. And then finally, the, the albumin toxins get got, uh, eliminated by sequential removal by a charcoal and then an ion exchange column. So that, in a nutshell, is the difference between the circuit when you compare CRT versus the Mars circuit. I'll stop right there. Thank you for your attention.